In the summer of 2009, the Friends of the Page Walker decided it was time to begin studying and share what we learned with others. We started by making a list of the cemeteries we knew of. Then we began looking for more. Our list kept growing and growing. We've identified nearly 50 just in Cary and its surrounding areas. And we're still counting. This list shows just a few of those we've identified. The ones in yellow text are those we have covered in earlier programs. We'll take a quick review of them now. In 2009, we presented our first program, a guided tour to Cary's Hillcrest Cemetery. Located near downtown Cary at the top of Page Street, Hillcrest is an active cemetery and the final resting place of 15 of Cary's mayors and other notables, including Captain Harrison P. Guess, Dr. J. M. Templeton, Marcus Baxter Dry, and Dr. Frank Yarbrough. The Friends of the Page Walker have made it easy for you to take, you to take a self-guided tour. Through a generous cultural arts funding grant, the town of Cary provided the Friends the funds to create and print a brochure for a self-guided walking tour of the cemetery. The brochures are available at the cemetery's entrance. We also have them at our refreshment table in the foyer this evening. We're actually in the back corner of this room. <laughs> in our 2010 program, we unveiled the mysteries and secrets of two more cemeteries. First, the White Plains Cemetery, also referred to as the Nathaniel Jones Cemetery, once part of the plantation owned by Nathaniel Jones of White Plains, a prominent landowner and public official. Once neglected for decades, this cemetery is now restored, thanks to the work conducted in the late 1980s by the Cary Historical Society, and more recently, by the Friends of the Page Walker. We continue to maintain this important place. We also visited the Cary First Christian Church Cemetery. This cemetery dates back as early as 1867, and was formerly known as the Cary Colored Cemetery. Located on Cornwall Street, behind the Glen Eyre community, the Cary First Christian Cemetery was also once neglected, but is now lovingly tended and holds deep family connections for Cary's prominent African-American families, the Arrington, Bates, Cotton, Hicks, and Stroud families, among others. The cemetery is also the first cemetery in Wayne County to be designated the local historic landmark. In 2011, we began to explore small family cemeteries, and we observed that they each had distinctive locations. You might remember the Turner Evans Cemetery and its location along a quiet connecting road that leads downtown. Probably the most obscure was this one, the cemetery of Carlos Yates. It hides in plain sight in the parking lot of an industrial site on East Chatham Street. The distinction of the Harrison Pope Family Cemetery, you'll find it near Lockmere Golf Course. And finally, the Yates Luter Family Cemetery. It is hidden in a subdivision roundabout where it was saved from development. In 2012, we toured three more family cemeteries. The Stone Maynard Family Cemetery, which was preserved amid the bustling retail center at the intersection of Davis Drive and High House Road. The Edwards Family Cemetery, which rests peacefully in a quiet subdivision. And the Mills Family Cemetery, which was preserved when it became the centerpiece of a traffic roundabout. In addition to these three cemeteries having been preserved amid development, they have something else in common, and it just might be a mystery. <laughs> in our very first Mysteries and Secrets, we posed this mystery. How do you find a hidden cemetery? If you've attended one of our previous programs, you know the answer is no secret. According to Donna Flowers, coordinator of the North Carolina Cemetery Survey in 1988. Anytime you ride down the road and see a grove of cedar trees, you can bet there is or was a cemetery located there. It was said that cedar trees were a very popular way to mark the location of the cemetery. In researching local cemeteries, we found an abundance of resources. The internet provides helpful sources for cemetery surveys that describe the cemeteries and list the known identities of those buried there. But some of the richest sources were right here in Cary, including Irene Kittinger, who shared her original survey records from the 1980s, some typed and some written by hand. It is in these records that you see the true labor of love that went into the surveys and the value they have for us today. Bob, Irene is here. I'd like to yes. stand up. Yeah. Irene, can you stand up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In 
developing tonight's program, we've connected with others who have been willing to share their knowledge as well. As you can see, we've had no shortage of good resources for our program tonight. If you are one of those listed here, would you please raise your hand so we can thank you, along with all of those listed, for your contribution. We also appreciate the sources for the many photos in our presentation. Before we start this year's tours, there are two more words of introduction that are called for. One is mysteries and the other is secrets. Let's first explain what we mean by mysteries and secrets. These are the things that haunt you, first when you visit a cemetery, but also when you leave. You're not haunted in the traditional Halloween sense, but you are definitely haunted by the memories and the questions. You're haunted by the stories that you know are there, but you're only seeing a glimpse of. And as we go through this presentation, we'll mark those things that intrigue us. Some are mysteries and some are secrets. These symbols will point the way. Mysteries are marked with a question mark, while secrets are indicated by these spooky eyes. <laughs> so let's begin with the mysteries and secrets of tonight's focus, the Green Level Baptist Church Cemetery. And I believe Carla, Pat, Pat Fish can meet us on this part of the tour. <laughs> Welcome everyone, we're so happy to have you here. Green Level is one of the town of Cary's three National Register Historic Districts. Thank you. The district occupies nearly 75 acres in western Cary. Green Level qualifies for listing on the National Register because of its architectural and agricultural significance. You can see here that the Green Level Baptist Church is located at the center of the district. At the time the district was nominated for National Register status, contributing resources including two stores, a church, three dwellings, and assorted associated outbuildings, two farms with farmhouses and associated outbuildings, and the Green Level landscape. Sadly, many of these have been lost including the A.M. and Valaria Council Farm, lost to development, the Vic Council Rental House, and the Green Level Community Store were demolished. However, several excellent examples of rural history remain in the Green Level Historic District, including the Elias and Daisy Mills Farm and Store, including a preservation easement on the vacant land view shed portion of the property. The Kenneth and Reba Mills House, which was preserved when the property was developed, and the anchor of the historic district, the Green Level Baptist Church. Fortunately, the church is thriving and active, so we feel confident that that will continue to remain there. Beautiful church. The Green Level Baptist Church, a beautiful white Gothic revival building, sits at the top of the hill on 18.54 acres of land in a peaceful rural area. The cemetery rests behind the church. According to an historical review provided by the church, Green Level was located on an early 19th century stagecoach line leading from Raleigh to Pittsburgh. This is also where we find our first secret. Why was Green Level a popular stopping place for the stagecoach? Some of you might guess, we'll see. Not only was Green Level about halfway between Pittsburgh and Raleigh, but the route included the old whiskey tavern in Green Level. <laughs> <laughs> it was a popular place to stop. Drawers would stop and rest and reflect. We imagine the tavern might have looked something like the one shown here. The history of the church is deeply intertwined with both the Green Level community and the Green Level Masonic Lodge. On April 8, 1867, a group of nine master masons met in a cotton gin near the crossroads of Green Level and organized the Green Level Masonic, Masonic Lodge. An AC Council, who had died in 1894 and is buried in the cemetery, was the first master of the lodge. And this is a symbol of the masons that you will often see on the graves of those men that lost the masons. At this time in history, there was no church in the Green Level community. 
Most Green Level families attended the Salem Baptist and Mount Pisgah Baptist churches, both of which were a short um, ride from Green Level. I thought this was very interesting. As a result of the Civil War, transportation obviously became um, a great problem in the community because there were no horses as a result of the war. Several families led by Addison Council, buried in the cemetery in 1893, pursued the establishment of a Sunday school in Green Level so that the people in the community would not have to travel. Mr. Council rode around the community asking res residents if they would be interested in starting a Sunday school. Members of the Salem and Mount Pisgah churches joined his efforts and on the first Sunday of April, 1869, the Brethren organized the Sunday School and elected Mr. Council as the superintendent. The first Sunday saw an enrollment of almost 100 members, which grew to 150 members from Sunday to Sunday. What? There seems to be a secret hiding here. <laughs> Can you guess what was the only building in the community? that could support the group that size. What <laughs> 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 is it they seem? The group called their first revival, led by Reverend S. M. S. Farrell in August 1870. And once again, the Old Whiskey Tavern provided the venue they needed for the event. The revival was very successful, and the young community decided to form a church. In 1952, a series of articles about Wake County churches stated that, quote, the minutes and records of Green Level Church kept from 1870 to 1886 were in good state of preservation. The handwriting was written in a beautiful old English script by Sidney W. Mitchell, the first church clerk. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Don't see much of that anymore. <laughs> On September 3, 1870, the Providence Missionary Baptist Church was organized, and the name was changed to Green Level Baptist Church on May 4, 1871. Of the original 16 charter members, eight members are buried in the cemetery. James Broadwell, Golden A. Upchurch, Adolphus T. Rogers, Addison Council, A.M. Council, John Scott, Columbus W. Mills, and A.C. Council. There are collectively 94 headstones, I counted them, <laughs> in the cemetery that bear the family names of three of these charter members, Upchurch, Council, and Mills. Reverend M.S. Farrell served as the church's first pastor. He preached the first Sunday of each month in the summer and fall for 15 years. He was born in 1836 and died in 1891 at the homestead where he was born in Chatham County and is buried in the church cemetery. As of 2015, there are four generations of Reverend Farrell's descendants who are actively participating in the ministry of the church. In August of 1871, A.C. Council and his wife, Lorraine, deeded two acres of land located 300 yards up the hill from Green Level Crossroads to the church and to the lodge. The deed read in part, quote, that for and in consideration of the high regard and good feelings we entertain for said church and lodge, we give and bequeath a certain tract of land. The document is reported in the Office of the Register of Deeds for Wake County, and in 1964, the church and lodge agreed to have the property divided and separate deeds were drawn. And if you've ever been in that area, the lodge is built in a separate building now right next to the church. After meeting for almost two years in the tavern, a two-story wood frame building, which you see here, was erected on the land and completed in January 1872. The church used the first floor and the lodge the second floor. The church continued to hold services in this building until around 1904 to 1905 and used it for Sunday school classes until it was sold in 1982. The present sanctuary of the church was built around 1904. The building is featured in the book 
the historic architecture of Wake County by Kelly Lally as one of the best preserved examples of a rural church architecture in Wake County. Green Level Baptist Church was incorporated in May 1975, and in 2001, the church was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Well deserved. In 1920, Green, and this is his first name, Green Titus Mills began his tenure as pastor of the church. Reverend Mills was born in 1878 and was a native son of the Green Level community. He served as church pastor and is the longest serving pastor of the church. Reverend Mills died in 1944, and his graveside in the cemetery is striking. You see the tall monument? And you can't help but notice it as soon as you, you walk up to the cemetery. Not only because of its large size, but also because the monument was erected by the members of the following churches. Green Level, Mount Zion, Mount Pisgah, Samaria Baptist Grove, Bethesda, Cumberland Union, and Bells. The words Holy Bible are inscribed on the top of the monument. And these, I'm sure, were churches where Reverend Mills served. When I went to the cemetery for my first visit in preparation of this program, one of the things that I noticed is that there were several gravestones with the name of Beavers. Now, I, Dr. Wayne Beavers and Carrie is my dentist, and I know that he, I know that he and his family live out in that area. So I was intrigued by the fact that maybe he was related to someone in the cemetery. So I went to the church office, and I want to tell you that the secretary of Green Level Baptist Church was enormously helpful to me for this program. I want to thank him. And so I, I sat down. I said, Jeff, I noticed that there were several grave sites with the name Beavers. Is, are they by any chance related to Dennis and Carrie? These are two of them. Paul and Wendy. He said, oh, yes, they are. <laughs> I was thrilled. <laughs> because I felt certain that I could probably interview Dr. Beavers. And um, so I, uh, I wanted to, uh, and also mention that I did, but as it happens, both Dr. Beavers and his aunt, Margaret Travis, who also lives in Cary. Um, they are two of the, of Reverend Mills, who I just talked about, two of his descendants. I had the great honor to interview both of them for the program. Dr. Beavers' mother, Wilma Mills Beavers, died in 18, 1984, and is buried in the cemetery beside her husband, George M. Beavers, Jr. Dr. Beaver's grandparents, George M. Beaver Sr. and Daisy Olive Beavers, who were also both buried in the cemetery, owned and operated a very large farm in Green Level. And Mrs. Travis spoke lovingly of that farm. She said it was a beautiful farm. Mr. Beavers also served as the principal of the Green Hope School during this time. The original Greenhall School, less than a mile down the road from the present Greenhall High School, was a small rural school established in 1927. The school was home to 200 students in grades 1 through 12 and was the first accredited rural high school in Wayne County. Mrs. Travis um, started attending school there in 1928 at the age of six. In her interview, she passionately praised Mr. Beavers, who served as a principal for many years as the, quote, best principal ever at Green Hill School. <laughs> she just loved him. <laughs> she also mentioned that the school produced the winningest basketball teams in the area, both boys and girls, and that the school had cabinets full of trophies. She also shared that Principal Beavers knelt beside his bed each night and prayed for his church, Green Hill Baptist, and the school and at the night of May 28, 1946, he prayed as always and lay down in his bed and died. The present Green Hope High School was built and opened in 1999 on a site across the street from where the old building stood. Per Mrs. Travis, the local residents strongly supported maintaining the original name of Green Hope for the school. Unfortunately, that's what happened. Here we have our first mystery. The original Green Home School building is no longer there. It's just gone. What happened? It was destroyed by fire in 1963 under very suspicious circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
Mrs. Travis um, is now 94, and she is Reverend Mills' daughter. And as such, she grew up in a parsonage of the church with her parents and her brothers and sisters. This is the a picture that she shared with me when I went to interview her. And interestingly enough, I asked her, since she was there, you know, as a part of the church, as being Reverend Mills' daughter, did she have friends that were um, daughters of the people that attended the church? And they did. She said they included the daughters of the Hilliard, Luther, and Council families. And all of these families attended the church. Mrs. Travis had a secret that she shared with us. It was so cute when she told me this. I wonder what it is. Reverend Mills was a Mason. And um, as his daughter told me, he truly loved being a member and thoroughly enjoyed going to the meetings. Now remember, the lodge is upstairs in the church. Not surprisingly, this must have created quite a curiosity in the little girl's mind because Mrs. Travis told us that she and a sibling or friend found the key one day to the lodge. <laughs> and went upstairs and opened the lodge. And so I kind of asked, well, what did you do? What did they do when they got there? And she put it, we just looked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she told them what they did with this, but I thought it was cute. You might have guessed um, that Mrs. Travis was a delight to interview. In 94, clear mind, and she was just so gracious. And I wanted to mention that 10 years ago, um, Peggy Vanskoyak, who's currently the president of the Friends of Page Walker, is um, a head of our program in collecting oral histories of Carrie's old residents. And so 10 years ago, she actually interviewed Margaret Travis. So we have all of her memories of having grown up in Green Level um, secure for future generations. Reverend Mills preached in Green Level Church the first and third Sundays of the month. At the time, the church would not pay him for an entire month. This is according to his daughter. So in order to support his family, he traveled to other churches in the area to conduct church services the other two Sundays each month. And I'm sure that, that are some of those churches are the ones that were listed on that grave to him. Mrs. Travis spoke glowingly that her father was a great preacher and said that the membership of Green Level church grew to 400 during her father's tenure, the largest number it had ever experienced up to that point. Mrs. Yates, Lucille Vandiver Yates, a teacher and writer, wrote a beautiful memorial to Reverend Mills, and this also uh, Mrs. Travis has shared with me. Mrs. Yates writes that Reverend Mills, quote, service in churches in which he was pastor was marked by progressive outlook, abiding friendship, and a fearless but joyful challenge to grow. Quote, he served prayerfully, God used him mightily. She goes on to say that G.T. Mills was a good man, he was kind, hospitable, generous, forgiving, and preached with a zealous compulsion that each individual must be strong for right. Only one of Reverend Mills' children followed him into the ministry. His uh, son, William, served as a Baptist minister both in Raleigh and Virginia over 60 years. And Reverend Mills' oldest two sons became funeral directors. I want to mention and add that um, Mrs. Travis was one of nine children that Reverend Mills had. She is the only child that is left living. The church owns and maintains the cemetery, which is located to the left and slightly behind the church building. In 1884, the church voted to purchase an acre of ground for burial purposes. The church property has grown to 22 acres, of which approximately two acres are devoted to the cemetery. At the time that Shirley Olson surveyed the cemetery, in October 2003, 461 burial plots were counted. As she states in the report found on the cemetery census website, there is room for more burials. Upon our visit in the cemetery, we certainly saw evidence of additional burial sites beyond the 2003 survey, and you can see some of those here. And now, how um, life is going to continue. One of the most important goals of our preservation committee is to report to the Cary community the status of the many historic sites and buildings in our area. And we fulfill this goal by presenting an annual program entitled, What Have We Got to Lose? Mm -hmm. And the program in 
informs people about Cary's historic districts, including Green Level, and gives the status of the district's contributing structures. And we note that the rich history of Green Level Baptist Church, coupled with its active and thriving status, have enabled it to remain preserved. So when researching information for the evening's program, we found that all of the original owners of the Green Level Historic District properties are buried in the church cemetery. The list includes A.M. and Valeria Council, uh, Elias and Daisy Mills, Kenneth and Reba Mills, Albert Mills, and Vic and Maddie Council. And we'll hear a little bit more about each of them as the program goes on. So the first one up is A.M. and Valeria Council. They owned a farm that included a late 19th century farmhouse and a significant collection of outbuildings, primarily related to tobacco cultivation. Unfortunately, this property was added to our lost category in our historic inventory in 2013. According to local residents, this property was built by the prominent area farmer, A.M. Council, and his wife, Valeria. Mr. Council was also known as Alfonso or Fani. <laughs> Interestingly, during our research in findagrave.com, which is a great website, we found Mr. Council's grave listed both under A.M. and Alfonso Mills. So that's maybe a little mystery there. Mr. Council was described in one newspaper account as a gentleman noted for the large sales of his famous bright tobacco and one of the wealthiest and most prominent citizens of the Green Level section. Elias and Daisy Mills owned a prominent farmhouse, framed store building, and a large collection of domestic and farm buildings. Elias was said to have managed the Johnson and Mills store, which is no longer standing at the Green Level crossroads, before building this house and another store on the property in 1916. He's listed in the 1920 census as a retail merchant of a general store. His store is shown here in the upper right corner of our slide. He lived on the property with his wife Daisy, his sons Kenneth and Willard, and his brother Eugene. Elias, Daisy, and both of their sons are buried in the church cemetery. The current owners of the Mills property stated in 2012 that they intend to preserve the farm, which is good news, although no formal preservation easement is in place right now. So let's move on to Kenneth and Reba Reeves Mills. Kenneth was the son of Elias and Daisy, and he was married to Reba Reeves Mills, and they built a house and surrounding outbuildings Probably in the 1930s, a cross screen level church road from the house and store owned by his parents. And after his father retired, Kenneth operated the store for a number of years and later ran the green level community store at the crossroads. And although there is no binding preservation status on the property today, as you can see in the photo on the lower left, the house was impressively renovated in 2014 and the clear intent for the time being is to preserve the house. More good news. So let's move on to A. Vic and Maddie Council. They owned a one-story house featuring simple Victorian details that was probably built around the turn of the century and used as a rental property. Vic operated a store once adjacent to the house. So lots of farms and lots of little stores in the area. Now here's another secret. Uh, what prominent green level farmer and merchant first rented A. Vic Council's rental house? Elias Mills and his family are said to have rented this house before building their new house and store just to the north. But sadly, the house was lost in 2012. And there's another secret here, although we find this one very sad too. A. Vic and Maddie lived in a house on Green Level West Road around the corner from their rental house. 
and this house was included in the Historic District National Register nomination, which was approved in 2001. The nomination describes the home as featuring typical late Victorian details, including a triple A roof, decorative vents, and variegated patterned shingles on the gables and a front bay window. Well, you must be wondering why we can't show you this house. So, sadly, it was lost to fire in 2012. Albert M. Council built a small frame building, the Green Level Community Store, when he returned from World War II around 1945. The building was operated as a store until around 2000, when it became part of a landscaping and nursery <coughs> business. Albert died in 1996. He shares a gravestone with his wife, Ruby, who is still living. And it's a beautiful design with two engraved hearts side by side indicative of a loving couple. And you can see that with the bottom, bottom left hand of that slide. So here's another secret. Well, we're really not keeping it a secret. We're just going to tell you. Uh, it's just that we can't show you the store. And why is that? And the building was operated as a store until about 2000, when it became part of a landscaping and nursery business. But then the Green Level Community Store was demolished in 2010. And although the nurseries built a new building that's somewhat reminiscent of the old store, maybe, the original store is sadly lost. So next we have the cemetery. Uh, Green Level Church Cemetery includes the burial sites of 26 military veterans. The oldest serving veteran was Charles E. Beavers, who was born in 1840, and he served in Company 1, 6th North Carolina Infantry in the Civil War. And according to Pat's tennis, Dr. Wayne Beavers, <laughs> Charles was Dr. Beavers' great-grandfather. Charles joined the Confederate Army while he was in his teens and became a prisoner of war very early in the conflict. He spent almost the entire war at a prisoner of war camp at Point Lookout, Maryland, where he almost died as a result of starvation and other factors. And if you study history in the Civil War and the prison camps, they were um, very brutal places to have to, to spend your time. He didn't return from the war. He did return from the war, fortunately. And he married Margaret E. Carlton in, 19, in 1867. And here we show engraving details from the gravestone, the Masonic emblem, and a callow lily which is a symbol of peace in an urn. Beautiful carving. There are 14 graves for men who served in World War II. Four from World War I, one from the Korean War, and two from the Vietnam War. The majority of the veterans served in the Army, but the Air Force, Marines, Navy, and Merchant Marines are also represented, uh, represented in the cemetery. Many of the grave sites are marked by the government military headstone, which includes dates of birth and death, their range of service, and their rank of the veteran, and where uh, applicable the war in which they served. So during our research, we encountered a moving memorial written for one of these veterans, U.S. Marine PFC Michael Stephen Mike Roberts, died in Vietnam in 1969 at the age of 18 after serving one year in the Marines. Listen to what he was awarded. The Combat Action Ribbon, the Purple Heart Medal for his combat-related wounds with one gold star, the Vietnam Service Medal, the Republic of Vietnam Campaign Service Medal, and the National Defense Medal. All in one the personal section of his memorial reads, a tall, lanky, happy-go-lucky guy, always a smile on his face, quick with a joke. Some called him Mike, some called him Steve, or just Roberts. To all, he was a friend. You are not forgotten, my friend. The movie tribute. Ray Ulysses Mills, another veteran buried here, served as a U.S. Army sergeant during World War II, died in 1994. His headstone reads, 
a hard-working farmer who enjoyed life, loved his friends, and died bravely. Well, it's always heartbreaking to count the number of infants and children that are buried in our cemeteries, and Green Level is no exception. There are 17 grave sites with the inscription infant, with the dates indicating the, day, the days the, that the babies died at birth or very soon after, and there are three graves bearing the names of infants that died at birth. One of the striking graves contains two headstones for two infant sons that died exactly the same day, and we would assume maybe that these babies were twins. Near the top of each stone is a grave of bird, and the birds face one another. There are lambs sculpted on the top of some of the infant gravestones, which we've seen in other cemeteries. And we also saw a square marble ground stone with a beautiful, beautiful inscription, budded on earth to bloom in heaven, for a baby girl who died in 1919, almost 100 years ago. Much loved by the family. So in our visits to local cemeteries, we also always encounter some particularly notable headstone inscriptions. And one such example at Green Level is also a mystery. It begins and ends at the Rigsby Yates family plot. Now this marker tells us just about everything there is to know about these burials here. It says the plot contains the reinterred remains of 20 individuals, all of them unknown. The cemetery was relocated in August of 2007. So you'll see these um, forms that I just happened to find um, when I was doing some, uh, just a tiny bit of research. I didn't do much research for this program, Pat did most of it, but I was able to do a little bit for her and found that the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services is responsible for issuing permission to perform grave reinterments in our, in our state. And so I found online the removal of graves certificate for the Rigby Yates gravesite. The graves were moved from the Copperleaf subdivision of Cary to the Green Level Baptist Church Cemetery in 2007 by R. Ward Sutton Cemetery Services. But the mystery remains as all the descendants whose graves were moved are listed as unknown. So I was disappointed to see that there, were, there was not one name on that list. Well, it was from a, from a subdivision, so maybe it was just right in the middle of where they went to the hill. So, uh, other than, I really don't know, but that would be a, a guess. So, another gravestone is inscribed with a Gaelic phrase. And does anybody in here read or speak Gaelic? <laughs> Okay, well, if nobody does, I won't, maybe I won't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce what it says. <laughs> it says, Anish as wheel. Okay, and when we did research on the web to try and find out what that meant and why it would be on this grave marker, um, we found that the translation is now out of danger. So this is at the grave of a young man who died in 1969 at the age of 22. And so, you know, we were trying to figure out, well, what does this phrase mean and why it was, why it was chosen? So if it means out of danger, um, I was able to do a little research and I found um, his death certificate and said that he died from an injury sustained as a passenger in an automobile accident. Um, so we don't know um, what prompted the family to use uh, that phrase, that Gaelic phrase. Um, it's just another mystery that the cemetery doesn't reveal, but an interesting one nonetheless. So now we'll move on to the gravesite for Columbus W. Mills. He's one of the charter, original charter members of the Green Level Baptist Church and his wife Nancy Ann Mills. And it includes the following inscription. The words mother and father are inscribed on the top of the stone, and under each name, respectively, are the words having finished 
life's duties, she now sweetly rests. <coughs> and under his, an honest man is the noblest work of God. We were also touched by the gravestone of a young daughter of the Upchurch family who died at the age of six. And the stone is beautifully sculpted with a tree trunk and with a dove lying on its side. Just the loving care that goes into so many of these memorials. But this next one's really striking, isn't it? This stone, marking the grave of Frank C. Holland, is certainly among the most elaborate engravings that we've seen in researching cemeteries over the years. And while we know little about Mr. Holland, this scene reminds us of the many farms that had been a part of the Green Level community. Maybe it was a view that was especially significant to him in some way. It's lovely, lovely work. So as we near the close of our tour, it seems fitting that we note the beautiful form of this marker for the Eatman family with its symbolic urn and the unique and quite moving inscription. God gives us love. Something to love, he lends us. Something to ponder. So as we leave the peaceful Green Level Baptist Church Cemetery, we remind you that it's not far away. It's on Green Level Church Road in Western Cary, so it's very easy to get to. It's always open to make your own discoveries and to find your own mysteries and secrets. So I'll hand it back over to Bob to close. <laughs> is just one of four historic preservation programs we present each year. Our thanks to everyone who, is, who assisted in bringing this program to you tonight. We do want to tell you about two events coming soon. Ken Farmer, noted PBS antiques appraiser, will present a program entitled Tales from the Road and New Discoveries. Friday evening, November 4th at 7 p.m. here at the Page Walker Arts and History Center. A wine, cheese, and dessert reception will follow. The tickets are $25 and can be purchased through etix.com. Our Antiques Appraisal Fair will take place here on Saturday, November 5th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Ken Farmer and his team will examine your items and give verbal assessments. The items to be appraised will be um, $10 each with a limit of three items at $10 each. Tickets are available through, again, through etix.com. Information flyers are available at the refreshment table in the corner. And that concludes our program for tonight. Um, thank you all very much for coming. And um, I'd entertain questions, but I probably wouldn't know the answers. But, <laughs> but there, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who really know, know a lot about the community and plus um, our researchers as well. So thank you for coming tonight.